Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you're well. Today is Wednesday, and it is the 6th of March, and we're getting ready for Shabbos. That's going to be Parshas Vayakel, as well as uh, Shkalim. So I'm going to share some insights into Parshas Vayakel today. We're not really going to have a chance to get to Shkalim. There's so much in Vayakel. So I want to start by sharing something beautiful from Rav Elia Lapian. Rav Elia Lapian, but before we get to Rav Elia Lapian's Devar Torah, let's, many of us may never have heard of Rav Elia Lapian, so let's get familiar with him. So we're going to first see just a brief bio, and then there's this beautiful picture that's got a, uh, I finally this week saw a good explanation behind this picture. So let's see, here's a, a bio about Rav Elia Lapian. He was European. Look, when he lived, it was 1876 to 1970, so he went, went well into his 90s. He was known as Rav Elia, was a rabbi of the Musser movement. He was very well known. He was a Lithuanian uh, rabbi, educated in all the major Lithuanian yeshivas. You know, some of them were in Poland, so to say, but that's what's always um, associated with the Lithuanian yeshivas. And he became very, very influential in terms of uh, Musser teachings and filling the role of Mashkiach, being someone who was really involved with the teaching of, of uh, Musser and ethics and yeshivas. Let's see, he was born in, I don't know how to pronounce that name, Grzewo in Poland in 1876. He studied at the yeshiva in Lamja and at the Kelm Talmud Torah of Rasim Chazitzel Ziv. Rasim Chazitzel was one of the students of of Rabbi Yisrael Salantra, one of the primary students. So Kelm, not to be confused with Chelm, that's the butt of all jokes, but Kelm in Lithuania, that was a serious Musar yeshiva that was known for developing a, a, a sterling Midos character refinement. And uh, many of the mashkichim from the yeshivas in, in pre-World War II Europe uh, had received some of their education there at, at the Kelm Talmud Torah was called. Uh, just to tell you something interesting about Revelio Lapian, when I was looking at his Sefer this week in the introduction, it says something fascinating. It says that when he was either nine or 10 years old, there's different accounts, his parents immigrated to America and he utterly refused to join them. Uh, at that time, it, this would have been at the turn of the century, there really were very few opportunities for yeshivas at that time. And he really, really wanted to study Torah, wanted to learn. And there were yeshivas back uh, where he was living. So therefore, he did not want to uh, join his parents. So here you have a little nine, 10 year old kid. Uh, he refused to go. And the parents went off to America. He stayed back in Europe, living with families and staying in yeshivas. That's very, very rare. Uh, to hear of something like that of a nine, ten year old, think about how many kids are homesick at camp. Now I think uh, I mean, this is just different times. Okay, so anyhow, he immigrated to England in 1928. So at that time, he is already uh, he's he's already he's over 50 years old when he moves to England, and he was a Rosh, one of the Rosh Yeshiva in the Yeshiva Eitz Chaim in London. Uh, it says there his wife, her name was Sarah Leah Rotman. She passed away in 1934. Now, if he died in 1970, that means uh, the last 40 some odd years of his life, uh, 50 rather, the, ra the almost almost 50 years of his life, he was alone. Uh, shortly after engagement of their daughter, Liba to Rabbi Leib Gurwitz. Rabbi Leib Gurwitz was one of the uh, Russia yeshiva in, um, in uh, I, I know, I'm not familiar with England, so I'm not sure if it was Manchester or Gateshead. I believe it was Gateshead. Okay, in 1950, uh, he left Eitz Chaim Yeshiva, meaning in England, and he immigrated to Israel. So he moves to Israel it's two years after the Hakama Samadina, two years after the modern-day state of Israel is born. And he spent the rest of his life, next 20 years, he was a mashkiach, meaning he was really a, a, a great teacher of, of Musar and ethics. The two yeshivas, uh, Knesset Chizkiyo, were really that one yeshiva, but it was first located in Zechor Yaakov, later in Kfar Hasidim. Uh, he died in 1970. He's buried on Harazesim. And his work, Lev Eliyahu, that's what we're going to be seeing our first of our Torah from today. Lev Eliyahu, it wasn't something that he himself wrote. It was based on his teaching. His Talmudim wrote it. We'll soon see when we get to the cover page. There's a very famous student of his who you'll recognize his name. We'll get there in a minute. But this picture of this picture of Rav Elia Lapian, I'd always seen this. And I finally, this week, I saw a beautiful explanation behind this picture. So here's a picture of him. And you'll see he's feeding a cat. And it just looks like the saintly, elderly Talmud Chacham. 
you can see he's got his white beard. It's the, you know, can't see his face really, but he's he's feeding a cat. And I was always wondering what's the story behind this. And I knew okay, he's a he's a he's a real Bob Musser, he's an ethical person. He probably had Rachmanis. He saw a stray cat. That that was what I just thought. Uh, this week I saw a good explanation behind this. Look at this Devar Torah. This was from a larger a larger Devar Torah. It was entitled Animal House. Uh, and it was uh, written by Rabbi Mordechai Kamenetsky. So let's see, just see this, where he brings down the background to the story. Back, back, back story to this picture, rather. In the northern part of Israel, is Yeshiva Kfar, in Yeshiva Kfar Hasidim, had established itself as a prominent center of, I'm just moving this up for the people who are online, of, of Torah scholarship. Students flock to the Yeshiva to gain spiritual nourishment from the, the Mashkiach, Dean of Ethics, Rabbi Elia Lapian offered. But the yeshiva attracted more than students speaking spiritual nourishment. The basement in which the pasta, flour, and other dry goods were stored also attracted those seeking nourishment. It became infested with rodents. The students decided on a simple solution to their problem of diminishing food supply and the health hazard. They scoured the rubbish piles of the city and brought a stray cat back to the campus. Every day it would play in the yard, and each evening they would bring it back to the basement where it would earn its keep, receiving room and board simultaneously. Yes. Within a few weeks, there was not a rodent to be found, but the cat remained. The boys lapsed in their commitment to its welfare and even forgot to feed it. One evening, it scratched on the screen door of the aged mashkiach, Agon Revelia Lapian's home. He was puzzled, not informed about the extermination stratagem in a student body. He wondered where the cat came from. One of the younger students explained the problems of the mice and the ingenious solution. With that, the boy explained the presence of the cat that had made its way to the sage's home. Are there still mice? asked Rebellia. No, exclaimed the student. There hasn't been a rodent in days. Then he smiled while looking down at the cat and added, thanks to this fellow. And since there are no mice, what has he been eating? The boy just shrugged. He simply didn't know. Ah, said the sage, you have been lax in your responsibility and gratitude. I'll show you how to feed a cat. With that, Revelia, a man in his 80s, went into his kitchen, poured milk into a saucer, and placed it down for the hungry feline. You know, so many cats in Yerushalayim. They brought, they, they brought them in at a certain point when there was an infestation. The British brought them in, and they just ran wild in Yerushalayim. So, so here he was, he was showing the students, top of page two, at that moment, a young student named Kavinsky captured the moment on film. The picture of the white bearded Torah giant bending down and feeding a cat remains one of the most popular pictures among thousands of youngsters in America and Israel. So that finally is the backstory of that picture. I had seen that picture many times as a kid. And uh, I, I remember at school, they would always talk about this when it came to Tsar Bali Chaim, about how we don't want to cause harm to animals. Uh, to show, and not only do we not cause harm, look at this tzaddik, Revelio Lapian. Here he was, he was feeding a cat, but no one ever knew the backstory of that picture. Now you know the rest of the story, right? Paul Harvey, that was his life. Okay, so we're going to see, now that we know a little bit of the background to Revelio Lapian, we know a little bit about him. Now we're going to see uh, a, a beautiful Dvar Torah he, that he had. Now I told you that Revelio Lapian Safer was called, here's some more handouts here. Ravel Yalapian Sefer is called Lev Eliyahu. And I said he didn't write it himself. It was it was based, it was a collection of his famous teachings that he had given over in Yeshiva and his students put it together. Who was the chief editor of this project? Well, let's look at the bottom of page two. There you will see the title page of Lev Eliyahu on Shemos. That's where we're getting this from. Look at it says Sefer Lev Eliyahu, Parshia Satora, Sefer Shemos. And then it says, um, a little bit further down, Me'es, who is this by? Rabbeinu Agon HaTzadak, Saba Kadisha, our holder, holy elderly sage, Marna Elia Lapian, Eliyahu, so his real name was Eliyahu, everyone called him Elia. Shirbit's Torah Keshivim Shana, he taught Torah for close to 70 years, Beshiva Sakdoshos, Barats of Chutzlarts, both in Israel and in, in outside of Israel, meaning in England as well. Now look at the next line. Nerechu Vesodru Berachava Vatama, who put this all together and who edited it and expanded upon it? Aide Ze'ira Demin Chavrei, the smallest of his of the chevra of the students, Shalom Mordechai Akoin Shvadran. This was the famous Rabbi Shalom Shvadran, the Magid of Yerushalayim, the one who so inspired Rabbi Pesach Kron, his whole Magid series. That's all based on the Magid of Yerushalayim, Rabbi Shalom Shvadran. He was a student of Rabbi Eli Lapian. He's really responsible for us having all the different Torah of Rabbi Lapian in Leve It was that was uh, his his baby. That was his project. 
it was his passion to to get this in writing and to record it for posterity. Interesting uh, detail. We we don't often know who was responsible for this project. I'm happy that they uh, they credited him there what credit was due. So let's see what pasuk he's going on. He's going on a pasuk. If you look a little bit further up on page two, it uh, towards the top of the page, the beginning of the parsha Vayakel. So Rav Elyel Apian takes note of something. We're going to see this pasuk Aleph and then pasuk Chaf. Pasuk Aleph begins. Vayakel Moshe is called Adas B'nei Yisrael. Moshe calls the whole Hebra. Everybody's got to come listen. I've got instructions to give out. Vayom Raleim, he says to them, Eilad Varm Asher Tziva Hashem Asosasam. I'm about to share with you, this are everything that Hashem commanded everyone to make. And he goes through the instructions again about all the items that were going to be necessary for the Mishkan. He gives them the tziva, he gives them the instructions about Shabbos, that even though it, no matter how important it is to build the Mishkan, Shabbos comes first. That we'll find in the Parsha this week. Now, almost 20 Pesachim later, Pasachav, when he's done with his little speech, Vayetsu kol adas b'nei Yisrael, everybody leaves, milifnei Moshe, from before Moshe. Okay, that's the Pasuk. We see it every year. Let's take a look at page three now, and we're going to see a beautiful idea from Revelio Lapian, and this is going to sound so similar to maybe some of the lessons we've heard from some of our teachers when we were in yeshiva. I'm, I'm sure we can all think of occasions. I, I'll, I'll share some with you soon. But let's see. This is It's a larger piece, but this is the beginning part of it. Vayakel Moshe es kol adas b'nei Yisrael. That's Pasuk Aleph. And then it continues with Pasuk Chav, after they all, he gave his speech, and after they're all gathered, they all left from before Moshe. So Rev Lapian, Rev Lapian was bothered. There's a there's a striking question here. Why did the pasuk feel the need at the end of this little segment here in pasuk Chaf, Why did it have to write Vayetzei Milafne Moshe? That they all left Vayetzu. That everybody left Milafne Moshe. They all left from before Moshe. When this little episode began, it started by saying Vayakil Moshe is called Adas Bnei Yisrael. Moshe gathered them. So if he gathered them, who are they in front of? Moshe. They just sat to hear the speech, and now they left. I know who they left. They left Moshe. They didn't go anywhere in between. It, it, we know the Torah is very uh, careful in choosing its words. This seems to be extra. This seems to be redundant. What do we need this for? So he says, You could have ended this little segment by writing simply, They all left. We'll automatically know that that means they left from, from before Moshe. Moshe had gathered them. He had summoned everyone. They were all before him. He gave his lecture, and now they left. Why do I got to throw in that detail at the end to say that they left from before Moshe? Of course, that's where they were. That's his question. In order to explain this, I want to explain this by quoting a Pasuk from Mishle, a verse from Proverbs. It says there, that if a person chooses to spend time with leitzim, a leitz is usually a scoffer, someone who just makes a joke out of everything that could be serious, it's all laughing matter. But to those who are modest, he will, he will, um, he will uh, have grace. Rashi explains, this is a very cryptic passage, Rashi explains, Parish Rashi, Shimadam Nimshech Akar Aleitzim. If a person chooses to spend time to be in the company of scoffers, we're all affected by our surroundings. So if I choose to hang out around a bunch of scoffers, I choose to hang out around a bunch of people who make jokes out of things which ought to be serious, then I'm gonna I'm gonna be a joker too. I'm gonna scoff. That's just we're all affected. We're all uh, we're all affected by our environment. But but then the Pasuk, Shlomo Melch is telling us in this Pasuk initially, if I choose instead to hang around with humble, modest people, in the end of the day, my actions will achieve grace in the eyes of other humans. Meaning why? Because I their behavior will have rubbed off on me. If I chose to, to spend time around people who are humble and modest, they'll rub off on me. I'll start to emulate their ways, and therefore other people will be will will be will take my actions uh, with grace. So, so Rav Lapian says that's what's going on in this pasuk. It says, Moshe." Everybody left when they were done hearing Moshe's speech. They left Milifne Moshe. They left from spending time with Moshe. Klomar, what does that mean to say? Shehekiru aleim. It was recognizable about them. If you would look, if you would have seen everybody exiting, you could know right away from the spring in their step where they just were. 
it was recognizable about them. There was something about them. There was a spring in their step. There was something that was that was full of humility, of, of uh, being modest, of spirituality. Moshe had rubbed off on them. So it was that's what the is saying. They all left, and it was obvious about their demeanor, about their behavior, that they had just left from spending time with Moshe. Because very often in life, you can have a person that you see walking on the street, they just left somewhere, but it's not apparent where they left from. Where did they just spend time? I don't know. I don't have video footage. I have no idea where this person was before I bumped into him or her. But if I see somebody that they can't walk in a straight line, where, where would I think they just spent time? They were at the tavern. That's his Simon Muvak. That's an obvious sign. She Yatsami base Merzach. They just left the tavern. They just left the pub. Shasayayan. This person's inebriated. Vinish Takera, they're drunk. So in other words, there are people in this world that you could tell from the way they're walking. You could tell from their actions, where were they just hanging out? If I see someone they're just wandering around and you know they're you know you know it's obvious they were just in the tavern in the pub. This also applies to the opposite extreme in terms of the good. Ksiv, if the Torah says the Moshe, that the Jewish people left from spending time with Moshe. this teaches us, even if they weren't successful at learning from him. Let's say there were people who just really couldn't follow his lesson. They couldn't follow his his shear. Elarak Amdul Moshe, but they spent time in his presence. He was such a positive force. If they spent time in his presence, Kvar Kivlu Yiras Hashem Bekirbam, something changed inside of them. You, we've all had that we spend time around a good person. It could be someone who didn't teach us Torah, but we all know good people. We spend time around them, we walk away elevated. We walk away just, just as a different human being. There was grace that kind of spilled over onto their faces. Lahakirin, it was very recognizable. No one walks around that refined unless they just spend time hanging around with Moshe. Look at the look at the way that person is conducting themselves. They must have been spending time with Moshe. And this is exactly what Shlomo Melch was getting at in that Pasuk and Mishlei. If you spend time, the way Rashi said it, you spend time around Anavim. And who is the greatest Anav? It was Moshe. Moshe was on of Mikol Adam. So if you're spending time around Moshe, you're spending time around good people, people with wonderful character traits, people whose meters are impeccable, we're going to walk away different. But Kalvachomer, Ben Benoshel Kalvachomer, absolutely, you could say how much more so. Shalom to wait till Moshe Rabbeinu Torah Shekibo Misinai. If people had the chance not just to spend time in Moshe's presence, but to actually learn Torah from him, the man who, who accepted it from God Almighty himself at Sinai, Maneder Hayamarem. How how beautiful, how buoyant, how how brilliant their appearance would be. Vitalu Khoseim and all of their actions, all of their all of their uh their their walking, Afkishiyatsim of Nemoshi Bachopsio Paneshlam, every step they take and every every look on their face, everything is different when you spend time around someone who's just overflowing with so much wisdom, with so much godliness, and with so much humility. Everyone's a different person. So that's how he's answering his question, right? He started off by saying that the parsha begins by saying Moshe calls, summons everyone, come, I've got something to share. 20 sukkum later, we're told they all left Milafne Moshe. Why, what's the Pasuk teaching us? He's telling us because when they left, it was so apparent that they had obviously just come from Moshe. The same way a shikar, the same way we could tell about a, a, a drunkard that it was so obvious that guy just left the pub. These uh, Klaistral, after spending time with Moshe, you know, it, it, no question. It's obvious they just spent time with Moshe. That's the effect of hanging around and spending time in the presence as great as Moshe, what effect that could have on us. Now look what Rev Lapian does with this. You got to remember his position in yeshiva uh, for for close to fifty years was well when he was in England he was also a rosh he was giving shiur and gemara shiur and everything but in Israel those last twenty years of his life his primary responsibility was a teacher of ethics he was a mashkiach he was given musar shmuzin so now look what he does with this lesson how he gives it to the yeshiva students and again this is I think we'll all recognize uh, uh, being told this by our teachers our parents at some point in our lives look what he says here kiddush Hashem Mayata, now that we know this is true, that our actions, our behaviors, that shed lights on where we just spend time. So he says, look at the opportunity and the responsibility we all have. 
It's important, it's crucial that each and every one of us need to know. When we're on vacation, when we go home from yeshiva, and, and a, a student, a yeshiva student goes back home. It has to be recognizable about that student. Our actions have to speak volumes. Anyone, anyone should look at us and see the way we're behaving, conducting ourselves, speaking to others, what we're doing with our spare time. It should be recognizable. It should be instantly recognizable. Oh, yeah, that's someone who obviously spends time in yeshiva. The same way that when people left Moshe, that there was chen, there was graciousness that was just oozing out of their face because they were spending time with Moshe, the Hadar Sivasov, and based on the, the glory of their surroundings, the whole Tenua Tenua Shalom. So a student who comes home from Yeshiva, all their actions, their activities, everything needs to demonstrate this. Because people are going to be looking at, at, at us and people are going to look at those students and say, well, where did they spend time? Well, what does that tell me about yeshiva? What does that tell me about Torah? What does that tell me about people who spend time studying? And God forbid they shouldn't cause a chil Hashem. Lomar, that caused, to cause people to say, Hinei, this is someone who claims to be from the nation of God and he just left yeshiva and now look what their appearance seems to be indicating if God forbid they're up to no good if they're not conducting themselves wisely what's that going to say about, about spending time uh, communing with HaKadosh Baruch Hu and his Torah and in, in yeshiva how many times did we go on I remember this as a kid we'd go on a, a, a school trip or a camp trip and one of the rabbi, I don't know if it was always a rabbi, it could have been the principal, it could have been a counselor, before that school bus would leave or before we'd get off that bus. Remind us again, we're all running around with our blue Hebrew Academy yarmulkes on or whatever it was, you know, or it was the girls too, whatever it was that had their, the, you know, had the, the school name on their shirts, whatever it was. Remember, it's our, everyone's looking at us. It's our responsibility to make a Kiddush Hashem and not Chas Meshalem Achilol Hashem. I, I remember that speech. How many times did we hear that? We heard that plenty. And here's Ravel Yalapia. He's saying this, and he's not saying this to little kids. He's saying this to grown people. But again, it's important to it's important to hear that we're all going to be judged, and Torah is going to be judged, Yeshiva is going to be judged, everything's going to be judged by the way its students behave, because where we were, our actions reflect where we came from. It's the same way that's true about that that drunkard staggering in the street, and to the other extreme, people who just left Moshe, their their actions speak volumes about where they spend time. So you got to be careful. Got to be careful. That's what he's reminding fellows before they go home for a vacation. Let's just see one more paragraph. He says, he quotes here a very famous saying of Chazal. Chazal, our sages told us, he says, it's in Yoma, there's other places as well. This is the famous one. Ma'u Kiddush Hashem. What's the definition of glorifying, sanctifying God's name? What that which the Torah states in Devarim. And we're supposed to love God. What does that mean? That the name of God, God should become beloved through me. So in other words, I have to cause people that they'll, they'll love the Torah, they'll love God, they'll love Judaism because they see how upright and how upstanding I'm behaving, how I'm conducting myself in such an uh, honorable fashion. She Kore Vishona, a person should study Torah, spend time around sages, and when I speak, my speech should be refined and it should be in a nice, pleasant manner, Ima Brios, when I speak to other humans. If I don't speak nicely, if I'm not refined in the way I conduct myself with others, and I'm not honest with others when I'm engaged in any kind of commerce, what will people say? Uh, the Gemara goes on to say, in Nebuch, people will say, well, if that's the way this guy's behaving, who needs to have any anything to do with the Torah? Who needs to have anything to do with rabbis? Who needs to have anything to do with God? This is what it produces? I don't need this. But the converse is that if someone says, wow, this person's so refined, the person's so honest, the person is so respectful, I, I gotta, I, how do I get some of that? Oh, it was Torah? It's Hashem? I got to get on that bandwagon. So it says, so he says, but again, if someone doesn't act properly, I raise a chil Hashem, chas v'shalom. No one's going to judge, oh, maybe this person really is a Tamar Chacham because, you know, he really knows how to split hairs on, on, on a Gemara. No one's going to, wow, he, he made a Siyam. No one's going to judge him on that. 
People will look at our conduct. Do we speak pleasantly with other humans? Am I honest in all my commercial actions? That's what will cause me to, to, to enable other people to have positive feelings about Hashem and about the Torah. That'll cause people to say, Ashrei Aviv Shalom the Torah. Praises this person's father because uh, parents because they sent him to study Torah. Asher Rabo praises his teacher. Shalom to Torah, Tadam Torah, Oylem Labrio, Shalom to Torah. Woe for all those who who just do not learn Torah because they're missing out. And God forbid it's the opposite. It'll be the opposite. That would be a terrible Chol Hashem. So Ravelio Apian is using this uh, uh, this to to remind students about the responsibility we all have. We're all ambassadors, and it's not just students. Every single one of us are ambassadors. Our friends know we're Jewish. Our colleagues know we're Jewish. People on the street, our neighbors know we're Jewish. People in the stores know we're Jewish. We have an opportunity. We have opportunities to make a Kiddush Hashem, and God forbid we have opportunities to make a Chil Hashem, to desecrate God's name. I always say, if we are going to act in an upright fashion, we should let people know that we're Jewish and that we're doing this because uh, because we're Bible observing Jews. Someone just recently uh, told me that she had a, an incident, well, a long story, but basically something went wrong with Target. Um, Target didn't charge her for, for a huge order that she had placed. And she went back to the store and said, look, there must be a mistake. Uh, I wasn't charged. And the person you know that she spoke with just said, uh, I don't know what to do. You know, it's your lucky day. So she called me saying, like, you know, is, is that good enough? Like that one clerk said that, like, do I have a responsibility anymore? So I said, look, I would go to the website, get the 800 number or, or speak to the store manager. I don't know if you're going to find a manager. Call up, say you want to speak to someone, say, hey, this is what happened. What would you like me to do? Put this on them. Put it on the manager. Put it on the 800 number the person you're going to speak to. If they tell you, okay, it was our mistake and you're good, okay, you did your best. If they say, wow, thank you for being honest. Yeah, you really ought to pay. Can I have, and you were prepared to pay and you should do it, but make sure to tell them, I'm doing this because I'm a Bible observant Jew. And as you're already going to do it, don't lose the opportunity to be an ambassador for Torah, ambassador, make a kid of Shem out of it. And, you know, it, it, why should everyone just say, okay, wow, you know, uh, that's the golden oldie America that I know and love. Okay, that is true. Okay, we all love, we 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 long for those days where everyone was honest, but make a kid of Shem out of it. Let them know that you're calling and you're doing this because you're a Bible observing Jew and that's what you want to do. I don't know how the story ended. I, I have to follow up with her to say to find out what did what did Target uh, end up saying in that. What's that? Yeah, I've had the craziest I've told them a lot of times and they say we have no mechanism in place for you to pay. So the, and I'll say, so you're telling me I don't have to, and I say no, but and I'll say, but I just want to be honest because again, I'm a Bible believing Jew, and, and that's that's what we're and they'll go, well, thank you, that's very admirable. But again, we appreciate, it, but we just have no mechanism in place. Okay, you did your best, but at the same time, you you make you try to make a kid of Hashem out of it. I had that once. I ordered I ordered some items and, and they were glass and they were packaged awfully. So it was let's say three items. So um Two of the three, let's say, broke. So one of them was still intact because it was wrapped in bubble wrap. But the other two weren't. They, they smashed. So I go online and you know I click to say that okay, yeah, the items broken in shipping. There's no way to say that only two out of three items broke and one was still intact. So they refunded me everything. So again, I finally found an 800 number and I called to let them know. I said no, no, no. I said when I said it broke, only two out of three broke. One was still intact. I shouldn't have a full refund. And they tell her like, uh, you know, listen, you know, you're making us crazy. We, there is no mechanism in place to do what you want. You got a full refund. So I, I, I kind of went through this a couple of times with the person. Finally said, like, I said, oh, I got to remember that. Uh, I said, let me just make it clear. The reason why I'm doing this is, you know, I'm a Bible observing Jew and I, I want to make certain I'm being honest. And they said, well, that's really, really admirable. Thank you. But again, there's just no, there's no method in place. But again, if you're already going to do it, you know, make it, make a Kiddush Hashem out of it. So that was what I was, uh, that was my advice. But anyhow, that's, I thought that was a beautiful piece from Revelia Lapian. All right. I want to share with you now uh, one more idea. Uh, and it's really going to be broken into two. So we're on page four. On page four. Yeah, page four. We're on page four. Uh, we're going to take a look a little bit later in the same parak. So I'm going to share with you an idea that I remember hearing this in in yeshiva from from Rabbi Leibowitz from the Rosh Yeshiva there if if it's time but I've seen many others make this point as well and then I want to piggyback off it uh, you know see some share it with you something that I I saw Rabbi France from Rabbi Left that fits very nice with this so let's see we're on page four 
a little bit later in that same parak, after it goes down the list of who donates what and, and which parties were, you know, really, um, you know, a, a lot of items, there was no way to attribute it. It just says the people brought this, the people brought that. But there are a couple items that are attributed directly to the Nisim, to the princes, to the chiefs of each Shevet, that they got up and they decide we're not leaving this to the masses, we're going to do this on our own. So let's see what those were. So Chavzayin and Chavchas, two Psukim. Chavzayin, Vanisim, and as far as the princes or the chiefs of each Sheva go, they, it sounds like they, they pulled together. They brought those precious gemstones that the coin guttle. He had one on each shoulder, and then he had the 12 on his chest on the Choshen. They, they donated those precious gemstones. And also, also rather, they donated all the spices and the oils, Lama Or, that were going to be necessary. That, that was the oil, uh, the Vesashem and Lama Or, all the oil that would be necessary for the lighting of the menorah, Ula Shem and Amishka, and for the oil that would be needed for the anointing oil, Lektar Sasamim, and for the Lektar. Now, again, it doesn't tell us for how long. They needed, that was stuff they needed on a daily basis. They needed oil on a daily basis. They need Ketoris on a daily basis. It doesn't say how long that initial donation was meant to last for. Was that a, a week's worth, a month's worth? I, I don't know. I, I'm sure the Mepharshim might explain that. But it seems like they gave the, the first bulk, like Costco, like pallet, you know, of, of oil and spices that would be necessary uh, for this. Again, I, I don't know how long. I don't know if that was a commitment. We'll take care of that every year. I don't know. What we do know is that they definitely gave the gemstones that were needed for the coin guttles uniform for his shoulders and for his chest plate. Now, what do you notice about the word nisi'im? See in Chavzai in the first word, nisi'im, there are some yuds missing. If it was spelled male, there would be a yud before and after the aleph, right? We have nakuda, so we know it's supposed to be pronounced nisi'im, but those yuds are missing. And if you look in the Torah, it's not just our chumash that I cut and pasted here that left out the yuds. The Torah left out the yuds, and it's deliberate. And we're going to see that Rashi quotes a chazal, Rashi quotes a, 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 it's a medrash that tells us exactly what, that's no mistake, that Hashem, our Mesorah is, that when you write your Sifrei Torah, you're not supposed to have a Yud in there. Even though Nesi'im usually has two Yuds before and after the Aleph, here our Mesorah, our tradition is, our Torah Shabbat is, that when you write the word Nesi'im in Parshas Vayakel in this spot, leave out the Yuds. Why? So let's see. Uh, so this is, I have here from the Sefer called Chidush HaLev. These are the uh, the the, the Musr Shmuz and the discourses that Rabbi Libot oftentimes gave over. I remember him repeating this one a couple times during the year that I was during the years I was in yeshiva. But again, I, I've seen this brought down in other people's. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I've seen it, I've seen others mention this idea as well because you'll see what he's doing. He's really going to speak out and explain a Rashi here with a with a Musr angle, which you'll see many other Bali Musr pick up on this as well. So he quotes the pasuk there Chav Zayin. That the Nisiim they donated those precious stones that were going to be on the shoulder and on the chest of the coin guttle. Now here he wrote Nisiim when they put the sefer together as it should be spelled. You see a yud before and after vowel. But again, up above in Chavzayin, you see that's clearly not the way the Torah spelled it. It's not an accident. So let's see. He starts by quoting Rashi. Because of Rashi, Rashi was again. Rashi's not making this up. He's quoting the Medrash. Why, when it came time to let's say bringing the animals, uh, when when the uh, when the Chanukah Sabayas takes place, so they're gonna they're gonna donate the animals right away. Yet when it came time, and that's what we read, you know, Hanukkah time, the Nasi for every Shevet brought this carbon and that carbon. So the Nasim were the first ones to jump forward with donations when it came time to inaugurating the Mizbeach when the Mishkan opens up. But as far as donating the raw goods to build it, they were not the ones who first jumped up. We first read about how all the people donated, and then the Nasim, these are the items that they donated. This was the mindset of the Nisim. Let the masses donate. Let them do the work that they're able to do. And whatever is lacking when they're done, when the Hamon Am, when the, you know, when, when the masses get done with their donations, whatever is left, whatever uh, is, is remaining, whatever is missing, I should say, we will fill in that, that, um, 
that missing amount. But they were surprised because everyone donated enough. There wasn't all that much that was lacking. Shenemar, because it says, the Pasuk states that there was there was plenty. There was plenty of material donated. So now they start to panic. They said, we were saying, okay, let's take the backseat. We'll be here to fill in the blanks. But now it looks like the people did everything. So they got all nervous. They said, uh-oh, we missed the boat. What's left for us to do? So then they, they saw, okay, there were still a couple items missing. Those gemstones were missing and the oil and the spices were missing. But as far as all the other building materials, it had already been brought. So then a VUS Avne Shoam, that's so they, that's why they brought the gemstones, the oil, the spices. So then they learned their lesson. They said, okay, here we missed the boat. There was a lot more we wanted to give, but we didn't have the opportunity. So when it comes time that there's a, a call goes out for, for donations to come in when the Mish, Mishkan first opens and they need to bring them the Korbanos, they're the first ones to respond. They said, we're not, we're not going to lose that opportunity again. So it says, uh, Rashi ends by, again, quoting the Medrash, What does it mean to be an Atzel? Be lazy. Since they were lazy, mitchila. Since they started off being lazy, when it came to the donating items for the mishkan, nechsera os mishmam. That's why they lost the yud from their name. Vahanesiim ksiv. That's why it writes vahanesiim without yuds. That's why if you look back in the beginning of Chav Zayin, there's a way to say it's a slap on the wrist. Teach you a lesson. For all eternity, you're going to be recorded as nesiim. You're not complete. We don't have those yuds. That's a slap. That'll teach you don't pass up opportunities. When mitzvah opportunities come our way, don't be lazy. That's what we're going to learn from the Nesim. That's the Medrash that Rashi quotes. So he says here, Rabbi Lewis speaks it out. You clearly see from this Medrash that Rashi quoted, the Nesim, the princes of the Shvatim, they were punished and they lost a letter from their names. Because they were lazy, that they didn't initially jump up with goods to donate when a call went out for donations to build the Mishkan. But he says, I, I don't understand this. This matter Rashi is quoting is very odd. Rashi told us the reason why they didn't donate right away. Because they had a, they had a good cheshvan. They had a good calculation. They said, let the masses donate what they're going to donate. Whatever's lacking, we'll fill in the blanks. They didn't, they weren't just sipping margaritas under a palm tree. The reason they didn't jump forward was because they said, we want the masses to donate and whatever they're not able to do, we'll write a check. We're, we're, we're ready and able and willing to donate whatever is missing. That doesn't sound like atzlus. Lazy, my definition of someone who's lazy is that someone, as I said, they're sipping margaritas. Everyone else is running around doing work and they just got there. They got that little umbrella on the toothpick on top of it and they're just chilling out. That that would be an atzlus. This is an atzlus. They had a very calculated maneuver here. They said, let the masses give and whatever's missing. It could be millions of dollars that's missing. We will write the check. That's not atzlus. How does the Medrash call that atzlus to the point uh, that it's laziness, uh, sloth, sloth, it's like sloth-like behavior, and now they're going to be punished for it, that they lost a yud? Saruch Lomar. So what do you have to say? This is a very big Musr concept, Nagia. Nagia means like something in our subconscious, vested interests. We're not always even aware of them. We don't even realize if why we're operating the way we are. We might think that we're operating uh, because of reason A, but what might really be motivating us on a deeper level, a subconscious level, is B. So he says, This vested interest, this, so to say, subliminal force of laziness, this caused them to mistakenly uh, make an accounting. Yes, you're right. If you would have asked them to see him, why aren't you uh, jumping forward? They'll say, oh, no, no, we're not sitting at the pool with margaritas. We're waiting because we want the rest of the cloud, the rest of the zebra to do their thing. And when they're done, we'll fill in the blanks. That's that's what they would have answered. What they don't realize is what's really motivating that decision subliminally. What's really motivating them was on some small level, there was a degree of laziness that was operating in them. 
They were saying, yeah, what's motivating us is that we want the masses to act and we'll fill in the blanks. The Ilule Nagia some, but if it was not for that Nagia, for that vested interest, then they would have realized the truth. They would have said that's a bad calculation. They would have, it really wasn't a good calculation. When a mitzvah comes our way, we want to jump at the opportunity. Where they come up with this idea that let the masses go first? That was motivated, the motivating factor that they may not have even been able to identify. Hashem is telling us was atzlus. And that's why they lost the Yud. So in other words, sometimes what's motivated, it might look on paper that we've got a good reason for conducting ourselves the way we are. But the question is, where do we come up with that? Is that really good? If we could, so to say, get rid of that Nagia, get rid of that vested interest, then we could see, one second, that calculation didn't make much sense. And that's what happened here. The only reason why they arrived at this erroneous calculation was because it was subliminally it was motivated by this atlas, some degree of laziness. Chiddush Gara this is a huge insight into the way the human brain works. Shafil and Nassim Shaladar, here are the greatest people of the generation. Dordea, this is the generation that knew God personally. They stood at Sinai. Hirgishu Eza Kartiv Muat Shalatslas. Even they, they had some small amount of, of motivational force within them of laziness. And this corrupted their judgment and it brought them to actually do an Avera. Even though these were people who actually were able and they merited to witness and to, to have a revela divine revelation. We say that even the simple maidservant at Kriyas Yamsuf saw visions of God's glory that the great Navi Yecheskel didn't see. And they certainly knew what their responsibility in this world were. They know that today is the day where we're supposed to work, and tomorrow, meaning in all of my MS, that's where we'll sit back and relax and get our reward. Nonetheless, they fell prey to this concept of being sloth like. It's part of the human condition. We don't want to work. How many of us wake up every morning saying, I can't wait to exercise? I don't know too many people who do that. You know, sometimes you get a real exercise addict and after a while it can become second nature. But until we're at that point, most most of us resist. We're not looking to, to be busy. We're not looking to 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 to, to work ourselves hard. Even though they were certainly happy to be part of the mitzvah of building a mishkan, because even the simple folk got excited about this. So certainly they were excited. It only took a little bit of effort to get involved in this mitzvah. Still, once there was a little bit of atzlus, of this laziness that kicks in, they weren't able to act on this motivating force that the rest of Klai Yisrael was acting on. Last piece on top of page five. So this is at the end of his piece. He concludes by saying, what comes out of all this? Someone could be really great. Someone could have spent a lot of a lifetime working on themselves. Still innate within the human being is there's a drive within us that we just want to take it easy. We can't even we can't even relate to this amount that they had. These were great people. They they had seen Sinai. They they were the Nesim. Certainly was a very small amount, but nonetheless, even that small amount was able to corrupt them. That corrupted their thinking, made them come up with an erroneous calculation. And it, and it prevented them from getting involved in one of the greatest mitzvahs of building a mishkan. Even when there was incredible motivation to get involved. So now we can say about ourselves, how easy it is for us who are nowhere near on the spiritual plateau as those giants, how easily it is for us to get caught up in Averos and come up with the craziest calculations based on the fact that somehow a motivating force within us is to be lazy. 
So we have to double check. We have to ask ourselves. I might come up with a calculation why I'm not getting about why I'm not doing this mitzvah, why I'm not doing this. And it might, I might have the most eloquent explanation for why I'm not getting involved. But what I really need to do is push the buttons and ask myself, come on, Miles, be honest with yourself. Is it laziness? Is that the truth? Oh, you just have this really eloquent speech about you don't want to do this. You don't want to get involved. Is it laziness? Come on, be honest. Let's be honest with ourselves. I remember we used to always call that pushing the buttons. And there's, it's like, you know, to question ourselves. Just make sure, is this is this motivating? Is this playing a role in my decision-making process? If we don't question ourselves, if we don't ask ourselves, we could fall victim to the same thing that the Nassim fall victim to here. They had a wonderful explanation about why they weren't getting involved in the building of the Mishkan. But at the end of the day, Chazal saw it, that it was motivated by Atlas, by some degree of laziness, and that's why Hashem gets slapped, takes away the Yud from their names. I, I remember hearing this in Yeshivas, and, 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 you know, on many occasions there, and this idea, this idea that we should ask ourselves sometimes uncomfortable questions, to question our motivations, and ask ourselves, if I'm not doing something, if I've made a decision, and I might have a great speech about why I'm making this decision, but to ask myself some uncomfortable questions, come on, uh, uh, what's really motivating me? Am I motivated by this, this? I, I remember a great example, we used to always quote in Yeshiva, is that there's a matter that says that when Yaakov Avinu is going down to Mitzrayim, to finally meet Yosef, because he's got a word that he's alive. He stops, he brings Karbanos, and one of the things he says is he qu starts questioning himself, saying, am I just doing this because I'm a glutton, that I, I ran out of food back up in Canaan, and I know that there's food in Mitzrayim. Why is he doing that? He, he's going there, isn't it obvious? He's going there because Yosef is there, and he wants to be reunited. So I remember in Yeshiva, they would always say about that, he's pushing the buttons. That's exactly what he's doing. He's questioning himself, just trying to see what's my real motivation? What's really, am I, am I, I know I've got a great speech about why I'm leaving Israel and why I'm going down to Mitzrayim, but what's really motivating me? Is this Lishma? Is this for the right reasons? Or am I just hungry and I know that I can get food down there? What, what's really motivating me? So I mean, that's the idea. So same thing here is that if we've come up with an explanation, and especially I see the rest of Claudius are all doing something and I'm not, I'm sitting on the sidelines. I got to ask myself, why am I not doing what everyone else is doing? Okay, I got this great calculation. Let everyone else do and when they, what they can't, I'm going to step up and do. But what's really motivating me? That's what should have been asked. That's what they didn't do here. Now, I just want to get one more minute here. I want to end by saying, sharing with you something beautiful I saw from Rabbi Zev Leff. Rabbi Zev Leff lives in Israel. He's American. Uh, many people know him from the years he spent in America. He was actually a, a very uh, early person who was uh, very active with NCSY in its, uh, in its uh, beginning days. He was a rabbi in Florida, and uh, he saw the great need for NCSY and the great work it could be doing with teens. And uh, he, he he really um, did a lot with that in its early days. So uh, Rabbi Leff, after he moved to Israel, that's probably how many of us think of him now. But here he just has a beautiful point. Okay, granted, all this is true, what we just saw. But why, if you got to give a patch to the Nisim, what's the message in taking away the Yuds? Of any way you could have done it, what's the message there? Look at this beautiful idea. I want to share this with you. So I've seen this quoted, and it's in. he has a safer uh, in English called Outlooks and Insights. I've seen it in there, but I also saw that that it's quoted online in different ways. Here I want to share with you the way Rabbi Fran says it over. Rashi cites the fact that the Nisim princes, when solicited to donate the Mishka, and told the solicitors to collect from everyone else first. They would volunteer, they said, to fill in the gaps, whatever was lacking at the end of the building campaign. The general populace, however, contributed everything necessary for the building, even to the point of having a surplus. Nassim therefore gave the precious stones that were not part of the main building fund. However, the Torah was critical of their laziness in contributing and dropped a letter from the name Nassim. That's why they don't have Yuds in their name. We would look at their offer as very admirable. If we were conducting a building fund campaign and receiving an offer from a donor to make up any deficit remaining at the end of the campaign, we would consider that a tremendous offer. The Torah, however, is critical of the actions. What was wrong with their approach? The problem with that approach is that they should have realized that in building the Mishkan, there could be no such thing as a deficit. A deficit means a lack, something was missing, but God did not need our money in the first place. He merely gave us the opportunity to have the merit of participating in the mitzvah. There was going to be enough in this case, no matter what. The question was only who will have the mitzvah of building the Mishkan. The princes were criticized for losing the opportunity to participate in the mitzvah. Okay, that's his take on that Rashi. Now let's look at this last paragraph. Rabbi Zev Lef explains the significance of the punishment given to the princes for their laziness in contributing to the Mishkan. The punishment was that a letter was taken away from the word princes, Nisi'im, Nunshin, Aleph, Yud, Mem. 
it really should have been two yuds before and after the Aleph, leaving it just to read Nisa Im. If you have it, if you look back at how it looks on the top of page four, it says Hanis Im. We know that's the pronunciation because of the Nikudos. But without the Nikudos, it can also be read as Nisa Im. Nisa Im. You could Nikuda, you, uh, um, use the vo vocalize it that way. The difference between the two words is dramatic. Nisi'im means those who carry. That's what their name really is. Nisa'im means those who are carried. The princes were taught that they forgot a basic and fundamental lesson. The Ark of the Torah carry those that carry it, not the other way around. A person who donates to a Torah institution or to a Torah scholar should not think, I'm supporting Torah. Rather, he should realize that Torah is supporting me. Therefore, to impress this lesson upon the princes, their title of carriers, Nisim, was removed, and they were called the, the, the Nisa'im, those who needed to be carried. So in other words, by taking out the Yuds, you could pronounce the word different. And it, that's what he's saying, the clap on the wrist is, is that that's, that's going to teach a lesson there, is you've got to remember something, is that when it comes to tzedakah, uh, the, uh, that, that institution, the Torah is going to survive. God wants Torah. Torah is going to survive. The question is, do I? am I going to take the opportunity to get involved and to attach myself to it, to allow it to carry me and to get those zakusim? So that's what he's saying. By taking out the Yud, that was the message that Hashem was sending to the Nisim. And I, I thought that was a very, very nice take on that there. So I thought that this, this was a good way to end it because that's a, a very powerful Rashi. But then you're just left with, okay, so granted, they needed a slap on the wrist. Why this? And I, I thought that's a very, very good take on that. All right. I want to wish everyone a good day, a good Shabbos. Thank you for, thank you for uh, joining. We're going to just end the recording and I'll, uh, I'll,